Hi everyone, I'm Kayleen Brown of Device Talks. Some exciting news to start. Our first four episodes of AI Meets LifeSci has more than 8,500 plays. We're so grateful that you're interested in how AI is affecting our industry as much as I am. And as you've probably noticed, we took a short break and we did that to speak to our audience in order to better understand how we can evolve that series. We learned two things. One, there's an appetite for more artificial intelligence focused conversations. And two, we learned that though there's an appetite for these conversations, there's a hunger for these conversations to be specific to the medical device industry. So because of that, we've rebranded our series, AI Meets Life Sci, to Device Talks AI. Device Talks AI will feature exclusive conversations with the largest medtech OEMs and other industry stakeholders to better understand how they're using artificial intelligence to reshape the industry. But you can still find us on every major podcast platform. Just search for Device Talks and make sure that you're subscribed to Device Talks on YouTube. Now, today's episode is extra special as we premiere under our new name. First, you'll hear an interview with Joe Mish, Vice President of Sales at SmartTrack. Joe reveals how SmartTrack's cutting edge approach to market intelligence is combining real-time analysis with that human touch from a world-class team. Well, I better understand how AI has helped speeding up the market analysis process and how these technologies enhance strategic decision making in market intelligence. After that is our keynote interview with Dr. Ha Hong, Chief Artificial Intelligence Officer Endoscopy at Medtronic. I'll be joined by my AI Meets Life Sci co-host, Brian Bunce, and we'll discuss how Dr. Hong is integrating AI in Medtronic's endoscopy unit, the potential impact of AI on healthcare outcomes, the importance of patient-centric AI design, and the promising future of AI in the medical device industry. As always, I'm so thankful for your continued support, and I'm so excited about this new iteration of AI Meets Life Sci, now Device Talks AI. Again, we're going to be specifically talking to med tech companies about how they're integrating artificial intelligence for better health and business outcomes. So let's kick off our inaugural episode of Device Talks AI with my conversation with Joe Mish, Vice President of Sales at SmartTrack. Joe Mish, Vice President of Sales for SmartTrack Business Intelligence. Welcome to Device Talks AI. I've been so looking forward to sitting down with you and learning more about how artificial intelligence is integrating into the data world and um, helping our industry understand how the industry at large can look in the future. So with that, thank you again for joining us. I, I wanna start at a 40,000 foot level, Joe. So can you tell our audience really about SmartTrack? Uh, what do you do and who do you serve? Absolutely. So SmartTrack is a real-time software as a service business intelligence platform. We provide rich market level data, competitive intelligence and strategic insights to the medical device community. Essentially, we partner with medical device companies, OEM manufacturers, even financial service groups like VC and PE groups, as well as consulting organizations that really invest heavily in the med tech sector. Uh, I mean, I think that your your summary is a really great high level summary, but can you walk us through how real time analysis is being conducted and what real time means to you? Absolutely. So I think when it comes to data in general, I think the timeframes of those pieces of data and how it's presented is mission critical. So what SmartTrack does is we essentially evaluate hundreds, if not thousands of different data sources. So it could be things happening on a daily basis, mergers and acquisitions, financial earnings calls, new product development, revenues and market share shifts and changes, or just trends in new technologies or procedures um, and where the, where the markets themselves are heading. So it's a matter of our subject matter experts really hand curating that data to make sure that on a daily basis by each market and segment that we cover, we are reporting boots on the ground daily changes to help make sure businesses can make better decisions and move into new markets or new products that much faster. That's really helpful. And it sparked another question. So you mentioned subject matter experts. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so can you talk more about that and what that looks like for smart truck? Absolutely. So a very people heavy organization, which certainly has its benefits and it also has um, some difficulties. And I think when we start bridging the gap into artificial intelligence, we'll identify some of those areas. Um, but over 25 subject matter experts on staff, um, the CVs are, are beyond, um, beyond your wildest dreams when it comes to companies worked for and time served. Um, our VP and GMs across orthopedics and wound care, as well as neurotherapies, come from the large strategic organizations like Stryker Orthopedics and 3M and Medtronic. Um, and it really allows them the ability to understand the market, the roles that they did in their prior lives at those types of companies, and then to really understand what type of data and what types of insights and information do I need to do my job better and more efficiently. Wow. So being in the medical device industry for 16 years, I feel like a kid in a candy store. So you're telling me that you have an entire team that not only has experience in the industry, but they have experience looking at what the industry looks like today and being able to interpret that data to help support other companies within medical devices and healthcare. That's exactly right, Kayleen. They've literally walked in the shoes of a lot of the folks that we work with at our subscribing companies. Um, I think where it gets interesting is from a value proposition perspective, how can we make sure that we get these subject matter experts that are truly household names in the respective markets that they cover more face time with our customers. And I think that's where the AI piece really comes in. Um, it's sitting behind a computer and mining for data um, and or getting buried in Excel spreadsheets doesn't have a ton of value back to our clients. Our clients want to have face to face meetings and phone calls with these subject matter experts to really learn what are the industry happenings. We attend all of the, the global as well as national based conferences. We meet with other clients that typically our customers don't get to speak with. So they want to know where's the market trending? How are things progressing? What's a good area or a new market that we should evaluate entering or building a new product in? And the more that we can offset that manual work that the subject matter experts currently have to do, the better we'll be able to serve our clients moving forward. And we'll be back with Joe Mish of SmartTrack shortly, but I wanted to start our episode with Dr. Ha Hong, Chief Artificial Intelligence Endoscopy at Medtronic. Welcome to AI Meets LifeSci. Um, Kaylee and I are really excited today because we have the opportunity to speak with Ha Hong, who has a PhD in neuroscience. He's also the CAIO, Chief Artificial Intelligence Officer of Endoscopy at Medtronic, one of the, the biggest medtech companies in the world. So I think we have a lot to talk about today, a little bit of context. So Brian was afforded the opportunity to speak with Ha at Device Talks West uh, in October. So we have a little bit of the inside scoop, but I want to take it back a little bit, Ha, and talk a little bit about your background. So I was particularly intrigued that you went from physics to, and neuroscience to med tech. Can you walk us through that journey and then stop right before Medtronic? Sure, absolutely. So it's it was an interesting journey. Um, I I majored in physics during my college back in South Korea. Um, basically, I um, I don't know. I was you know fallen into the, uh, the 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 potential and the uh, the the profound nature of the physics that they can provide. So basically, I really love the physics in particular because it can uh, you know gives you a framework of modeling the world and also the universe. You gotta simplify, you gotta find out the gist of some complicated system and you gotta distill down into some key major components. And from that kind of you know discovery, you can make lots and lots of exciting things like you know some key equations or some theory that can explain or predict about you know some of the, the interactions among you know um, components. Um, based on some observations into the future. So I really enjoyed that part. Towards the end, at the same time, I sort of realized that I was a kind of mediocre physics student. There were so many brighter students than I was. So I, I sort of decided to, um, you know, kind of change my uh, topic. So um, then I, um, I was searching and searching, searching, searching. And I sort of realized that I really have enjoyed studying 
biophysics, especially in terms of you know, neuroscience and some intersection between the physics and the neuroscience. So that kind of naturally that led me into studying uh, neuroscience um, at uh, MIT um, PhD program. So um, I went to MIT, um, especially, you know, health sciences and technology program, and I studied in neuroscience there. Um, at the very beginning, um, I don't know, I think that I was, I was a little clueless. Um, and at the same time, being clueless sometimes can be helpful because I was too ambitious. I basically literally wanted to emulate the, uh, the entire visual perception processing uh, that's happening in the brain. So basically the retinal pictures, which is basically pixels that come into the eyes and that gets processed in, uh, you know, neural networks, um, actual biological neural networks in the brain. And uh, you, you know, you can't help but see like, you know, you have a, a phone and you, when, when you see the phone, you literally recognize this is my phone. That kind of, you know, perception processing happens in the brain almost automatically. I wanted to understand the neural perception processing in the brain. And that basically meant without me actually um, explicitly realizing that actually meant um, creating a computer program that emulates the end to end processing in the brain, starting from the eyes, all those neural transformations uh, leading up to the perception um, yeah, uh, that comes out from the system. So that um, kind of, it was a big problem. It was a huge problem. Essentially, it um, was a uh, holy grail of <laughs> <Yes>. uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and visual perception. Um, and I, um, almost by serendipity, that was, that coincided with a, uh, a time, an exciting time of, <laughs> The, the rise of modern artificial intelligence. In particular, there was the time where the uh, um, a technology called deep neural network started to take some traction. I realized that that is the technology that I wanted to use that, that can potentially allow me to, um, you know, explain and model the visual perception processing in the brain. And I did use that. So that's how I started to dabbling into <laughs> the artificial intelligence side almost, you know, um, 15 yeah. years ago. Um, so yeah, that uh, kind of led me into, I don't know, switching gradu gradually, uh, switching me from AI, uh, from the neuroscience side into more and more AI side. Towards the end of my PhD program, um, there was another serendipity. A good friend of mine named Charles Cadieu, at the time, he recently founded a startup company called Caption Health. Um, it was a uh, basically a startup company that wanted to do something interesting at the end, intersection between uh, artificial intelligence and um, medtech field. Um, in particular, we were interested in uh, um, applying the AI technology, in particular, you know, deep learning technology so that we can create a uh, AI powered cardiac mm -hmm. navigation um, program so that, you know, any novices um, who doesn't necessarily have a prior experience in scanning cardiac ultrasound would be able to acquire high quality ultrasound examination with the help of the software for the AI program. Um, with that vision, I joined the rocket ship and long story short, after eight years, um, we were, we have been very successful. We created the first FDA approved commercially, you know, available, um, AI powered cardiac ultrasound navigation system that can again, allow users with minimal, minimal training to acquire high quality cardiac ultrasound um, examinations that are really useful for um, diagnostic purposes. Um, we generating, we were generating, uh, um, uh, revenues with some, of course, again, FD approval and also some, um, really exciting, um, insurance uh, reimbursement code, um, and was making some, uh, you know, early impact, positive impact on how the cardiology, uh, cardiology could be done, uh, in a way that was, uh, that used to not, that used to be not possible in the past without that, that kind of software. 
um, and we eventually got acquired by GE Healthcare. So that was a kind of a journey um, up until right before my joining Medtronic endoscopy unit. So I was actually around during uh, your time at Caption Health, and I remember learning a lot about it. And then at the time, I think it was more considered digital health. So I think digital health kind of that terminology came before artificial inspired or artificial intelligence um, empowered. So that's kind of how I thought about it. And then I remember learning with that it was the first FDA cleared and commercially available AI powered cardiac ultrasound uh, guidance system. And, and then eventually, as you mentioned, acquired by GE Healthcare. That's really intriguing because I think there's a lot of resistance to adoption when it comes to artificial intelligence. But one of the things that Brian and I are trying to communicate to our audience is it's actually been around a lot longer than we think it has, but it's been maybe named something different. So digital health care. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to how that transition went from the neuroscience a kind of background, the physics background, and knowing that you wanted to apply it to medical devices, but then choosing cardiology. Um, can you kind of take us through how you took what you learned um, at MIT? And you were talking about sort of mapping the brain, creating a computer um, program. And again, I'm just uh, <laughs> summarizing poorly uh, what you had said earlier. And then knowing that you could apply those lessons to cardiology and to imaging. Uh, so can you talk us through that and then maybe what that process was working through uh, a nascent technology from beginning to end? Absolutely. Um, from my early education in physics, I learned how to simplify compli complex systems. So that kind of laid out a really good foundation for pretty much everything. During PhD program, I learned how to, you know, design and execute like long-term um, R&D program. Um, basically, as a, a startup company, as a founding team member of a startup company, I needed to create the, not only the technology, but also needed to carry out a very longer term state-of-the-art um, R&D project. Um, touching on many different points, not only the prototype, early prototype um, creation and, you know, the software development, but also, for example, um, conducting a uh, designing and conducting clinical um, experimentation, clinical trials that can actually prove clinical evidence um, and all the way down to, you know, writing down uh, the result in a succinct and um, scientifically provable way, i.e. statistical analysis and stuff like that. All those kind of education came from uh, my, you know, exciting days during my PhD program. Um, does that answer your question or um, am I missing anything else? No, I think that's really helpful for context. Sometimes, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels like sometimes the hardest step is that first step. You know, we have this idea, how do we take the, go from ideation to you know, fruition. Uh, so I think it, it helps to have case studies and lessons learned and that enthusiasm that you had in your, during your PhD program is carried over very quickly or very uh, clearly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And uh, just kind of, you know, as a side note, um, our choice of the problem, the uh, using the, utilizing AI in cardiac ultrasound navigation, um, you know, kind of, you know, problem domain. It was, I think that it was largely shaped by clinicians. So we are, as a, as a AI, um, as an AI practitioner, when um, Charles and other co-founders and I first started at Caption, we naturally gravitated towards, you know, more obvious problems, for example, like, you know, disease detections, which is distinct from imaging um, quality optimization and the guidance. Um, and throughout lots and lots of conversations with leading cardiologists, we um, saw, uh, we soon realized that the disease detection actually critically relies on good quality, high quality echocardiographic examinations or images. So in other words, 
garbage in, garbage out. If you want to have a good, um, high quality, accurate um, diagnosis, you need to have a high quality images. And that kind of, you know, revelations came through, again, lots and lots of conversations with leading cardiologists, including Dr. Randy Martin, um, who was our chief medical officer at the time. It's very parallel to, actually not even just parallel, it's exactly the same that what Brian and I have been hearing that with artificial intelligence and training the models, it's about the, the quality of the data in is the quality of the data out. <laughs> so um, that really helps piece it together. I was going to back up for a second because there's several interesting things that we talked about just now. One of which is the background of physics, which like physics is, this is oversimplified, but a lot of it is math. A lot of it is problem solving. So that's an interesting kind of tie in to AI later. And then the whole neuroscience space, like I've, I've heard from some of the books I've read that the neuroscience connection for AI goes back. If you um, look at it more broadly to the early 20th century, and then especially in the forties with like McCullough and Pitts and we have neural networks coming out like in the decades kind of the following in the 80s and the 2000s and 2000 teens you have deep learning but i'm curious about your phd background in neuroscience and to what extent that kind of um influences your problem solving approach like you've talked about how important it is to to make sure you're solving a clinical problem but i'm curious about that background in neuroscience and how that kind of influences you absolutely i'm I'm so glad that you actually do, did mention the, um, the intersection between the neuroscience and the artificial intelligence, especially during the, uh, the early phase of the rise of the modern artificial intelligence around, you know, 20, early 2010 up until, let's say, 2015, 16, 17. There was a huge and really tight collaboration between the um, neuroscience community and the uh, computer science AI community. So basically, you, we can think of in uh, you can we can think of that co uh, collaboration in the following way. So, like you know, back in the days when people tr were trying to figure wow. out um, to, uh, the building of a flying machine, uh, people really tried to emulate what the nature was doing. So look at the birds, look at mm -hmm. the uh, insects uh, uh, that can fly, and they from those observations they derived aerodynamics and some of the weight thrust ratio and stuff like that, that same parallel thing can be applied, I think, um, to the early modern rise of the artificial intelligence technology, especially deep learning. So people, you know, there's a natural intelligence machine, uh, which is our brain. So people took some kind of, you know, um, gist uh, of uh, the neural connections uh, so for example like you know the all the interconnections and some of the activation functions and you know some of the you know um the the, uh, the attention and you know the region um, suppression uh, all those kind of concepts were at least loosely um inspired from our natural um, art uh, intelligence machine <laughs> um, those kind of things uh led to I think that uh, those kind of things, at least, um, quite uh, dramatically um, influenced the early shaping of the, uh, the deep learning technology. Um, I was at uh, the neuroscience department, and um, we had also really strong and robust community of artificial intelligence and computer science, um, you know, scholars um, nearby. So. I uh, almost by serendipity happened to be at the intersection uh, between the two um, uh, community that led to the development of the, uh, the deep learning um, technology. And uh, yeah, again, it was a serendipity. I, I happened to be at the, uh, the epicenter. Well, on a different point, so you were at Caption Health up until was like earlier this year, like March, and then you transitioned over to Medtronic as like the chief artificial intelligence officer of endoscopy. Could you talk a little bit about what that process was like of how you got into your current role? Absolutely. So I, I, I had been riding a rocket ship for sure for, for eight <laughs> years. I created um, lots and lots of exciting and interesting technology that I believe that can positively impact patient care. I also um, have been working with uh, 
lots and lots of amazing and talented colleagues and friends. Um, it was really amazing journey. Towards the end, um, I sort of realized that I actually wanted to try something else. And that kind of coincided with the, the acquisition of Caption Health with G Healthcare. And that translated, trans transitioned naturally into my joining um, Medtronic Endoscopy Unit. So that transition uh, was facilitated by a mutual friend between uh, um, Gio Di Nap Napoli of our um, president of endosco endo endoscopy unit and, and myself. Um, the mutual friend kind of acted as a bridge between <laughs> the two different um, organizations. What was that call like, or what was that first <laughs> meeting with your mutual friend? I mean, I have to imagine going from what was a startup company and through the acquisition process and then getting a knock on the figurative door to be the chief artificial intelligence officer, the first named chief artificial intelligence officer for Medtronic was quite the surprise. I mean, how did that, how did that experience go? <laughs> <laughs> so I, um, yeah, it's, it, it was, it was. In, in retrospect, he was again serendipity. I, I kind of, I don't know. I kind of talked to myself, and you know, um, I, I sort of realized that, uh, I mean, uh, many of the things that I, made the, the path that I took uh, that I've taken, uh, have been quite heavily dependent on uh, serendipity and you know some random <laughs> events. Um, Sorry for rambling, but um, anyhow, <laughs> going back to your own question. So the, the mutual friend, um, she and I worked during um, my days at Caption. So she was, she was leading, uh, she was contributing heavily to lots and lots of, you know, FDA submissions. So she, uh, she's a regulatory expert. Um, and uh, I'm quite surprised, but um, it looks like I, I left a pretty positive imp uh, impression on her. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so, Gio and her uh, are, are quite close friends uh, with, with each other. And one day, Gio uh, realized that uh, at endoscopy unit, especially, uh, we wanted to increase the AI capability, especially in terms of the, uh, the strategy side. Um, and uh, she was talking to her and, uh, you know, the rest is, uh, um, it's quite, uh, you can imagine the rest of the, the, the steps she, I was the kind of, you know, one of the first, uh, uh, one of the first candidates that came to her mind and, you know, she helped, um, I get connected with you and that was Absolutely. the transition. <laughs> We're going to take a short break from our interview with Dr. Ha Hong of Bedtronic to bring back Joe Mish, Vice President of Sales at SmartTrack. Let's talk about how SmartTrack is embracing AI machine sure. learning to, if you will, reinvite solutions and bring value, as you mentioned, to your customers. Can you dig into that a bit more for us? Absolutely. So when I look at the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think what it's essentially doing is it's allowing us to analyze data um, and be more progressive with our data, obviously at a much faster rate. So if I try to break that down, that tells me that SmartTrack and our customers are trying to go to market faster. And go to market can mean obviously a lot of different things, whether it's a new market to penetrate or it's just a new product that we're building in a market that's currently being served. Um, so SmartTrack is really... Um, a, a taking a two-pronged approach to make sure that we're, we're identifying areas of opportunities on both of those fronts. Um, one would be the markets in particular. Since we are heavily relying on our subject matter experts to pull this data and hand curate all of the information that we put together, it's a big lift and it's very difficult to get yourselves into a new market. Artificial intelligence speeds our timeline to get into these different areas of coverage that our strategic clients have been asking for a number of years. So as we can better serve our clients from a market perspective, it will allow them to evaluate true opportunities in the markets that we currently don't cover. Um, and then I think the flip side to that, Kayleen, is getting into a market or building a new product is great, but that conversation at some point in time always turns to, well, what are the economics of this deal? Or what are the economics of this product that we're trying to build? 
And historically, SmartTrack has done a really, really good job over a decade um, worth of data and experience of providing actionable competitive market share and total addressable um, numbers to our customers. But the way that, co that clients report and that Wall Street tracks the market, it's really retrospective data that we're referring to. So what artificial intelligence is allowing our subject matter experts and analysts to do is essentially predict the future. So it's taking the model that was hand built by a subject matter expert, applying the machine learning, and then having us build out a forward looking forecast of up to four quarters to come. So now we can truly partner with our clients and say, here's a new market to entertain, or here's a new product where the growth rates or the reimbursement is a little bit better. And then PS, here's what we're expecting the next year to come to actually look like. And I feel like when you take those two or three ideas that I just mentioned and put them together, it's essentially the holy grail of market insights and analytics. Well, if our audience could see us right now, and they can on YouTube, they'd see that I'm drooling. Uh, so I started my career, I think I mentioned 16 years ago, so straight from university, I went to a business intelligence company for medical devices. And I was selling, I don't know if you remember, Joe, uh, but I was selling these large market research, uh, 500 to 1,000 pages, books, <laughs> if you will. <clears throat> and I've sure. built into... The, the offices or the the universities or the large OEMs, and I'd say, ask me a question, and I'd flip through the chapters and find the answer to information that we know know about. The idea that I could walk into that room today using Smart Track and say, ask me a question in the future, four quarters ahead. I mean, that's hmm. magic. It's a game changer. Very it, exciting. It will fundamentally change the way that Smart Track and our our um, customers do business. It's clearly smart track is embracing artificial intelligence. But from your perspective, do you see this idea of AI being a trend? Or do you actually see it as a long term fundamental change to your business? I think it's the million dollar question, Kayleen. Um, so take this with a grain of salt from my perspective and the way that SmartTrack views the technologies and the advancements, it's a fundamental change to the way that SmartTrack will do business and our customers. I think when you look at any industry, it doesn't have to be medical device um, or healthcare for that matter. There's very few technologies that enter a market and then remain and they don't get replaced by something else. Um, and I think really what is is allowing me to say that is the solutions that AI and machine learning are providing to customers and really the problems that they are solving. So we're up against economic difficulties and economic hardships really have been since the you know, post pandemic, post COVID days. And people are short staffed and resources are tight and bandwidth at the organizations that we partner with is just difficult and there aren't enough um, hours in the day, essentially. So I think when you look at the solution of going to market faster, building new products faster, offsetting the human touch of what actual people are doing and replacing the stuff that can be automated, I think it just brings this conversation full circle to say, there really is no reason why it would be a fad and wouldn't be here to stay. It's truly making advances in medical device implants and in the way that patients are treated and diagnosed um, that much better and that much faster. So I think it'd be really difficult to say, understanding that circle that I just mentioned, how it can be a fad and, and not here for the long haul. I have to hear here and second that. I feel the exact same way. Joe, I wish we had more time to chat, but thank you very much for joining us. Once again, we had Joe Mish, Vice President of Sales for Smart Track Business Intelligence, joining us on Device Talks AI. Joe, thank you for your time. It was my pleasure, Kayleen. Thank you. Now we're back with our interview with Dr. Ha Hong of Medtronic. From my understanding uh, that your role at Medtronic is Chief Artificial Intelligence Officer is the first of all of the divisions that has that title. So why in endoscopy? Like why, what was the need there? And mm -hmm. why would artificial intelligence be so uh, blatant in the title? Yeah, absolutely. Endoscopy unit is one of the operating units within Medtronic that uses artificial intelligence technology extensively. So that makes it quite obvious that we need to have um, good 
you know, processes, strategy, and vision around artificial intelligence. Um, the reason I cannot, I, I have no idea why, you know, endoscopy ended up being the, the first um, unit among mm -hmm. Medtronic. I kind of, my personal theory around that is endoscopy unit is um, one of the, one of the smallest uh, unit. And also as a result, we are like, um, we operate like a startup company. So when I was interviewing, um, Gio uh, told me that, hey, huh? <laughs> you may not believe me, but uh, endoscopy unit is like a startup company. I, I was like, you know, I, I didn't talk to Gio, but I was like in my in my brain, come on, Medtronic is such a multinational company with like, you know, tens of thousands of, you know, employees. How can this be a, a startup company? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, long story short, once I joined uh, Endoscopy Unit, I do realize that we are really fast and we want to make an impact on efficient and at the same time responsible way. We are like a startup company, but uh, um, heavily backed by the huge corporate, which is Medtronic. Um, so I, I kind of suspect that that's uh, probably one of the reasons um, um, on why. I was going to ask a follow-up question based on, so this year, like you joined the company and then like not too long after Medtronic also hired Ken Washington, who's also has a PhD and he's the chief technology and innovation officer. And um, similar to you, he also has a PhD. His is in nuclear engineering, another <laughs> very math heavy field. Um, so I'm interested in how you collaborate with him um, in that he probably has a broader focus on the company at large and your focus more on like endoscopy. But could you say more in kind of how you collaborate with him kind of across the company? Absolutely. So artificial intelligence, of course, is one of his focus areas. Um, he wants to make a, uh, a coordinated impact on AI across, you know, the entire organization. He created a, a uh, AI leadership team or AI core team, and I'm one of the, uh, the core team members. Yes. I, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we yeah. basically, um, are the, the, the leaders of AI and machine learning technologies across different operating units in Medtronic. We regularly meet, we share good practices. We also kind of think about some, some, you know, some common strategy and vision that we can formulate together, um, which can, um, which can uh, help the entire organization. So for example, certain ideas, certain initiatives could be too big to be uh, uh, led by any single organization, single operating unit within Medtronic. We talk about those kind of, you know, initiatives and ideas, like big initiatives um, that, that can be implemented across the uh, Medtronic as a whole, whole organization. So then kind of shifting gears just a little bit, um, I, I know I mentioned at the top of the interview uh, that you spoke at Device Talks West here in October. So listening back to that, you were speaking about patient-centric uh, AI design. Can you elaborate on how this theory influences the development process? Absolutely. In short, it's going back to the okay. basics. Okay. Think about the patient first. Um, think about the fact that your device will be used by patients and uh, one of your family members, it can be your mom, it can be your dad, uh, may use the device that you create. That gives us a really profound message that uh, we need to be really responsible in terms of the designing of the technology, including artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence, as we can know, as we can, as we know by now, it has huge amount of potential it provides lots and lots of flexibility and because of that um, it increases the burden of our uh you know proof so we as a device manufacturer um, it increases our responsibilities um, to prove that the thing the technology that we created is safe and also effective so that's 
the kind of the foundation of you know um, responsible um, you know way of creating AI technology for for healthcare. Going back to a little bit more of you know sp- specifics that um, mm-hmm. has a, a few different components. One component can be you know thinking through all those steps even during the uh, the, the planning phase, so that you know um, we when we design. When we prototype the initial AI technology, we really think through what we want to prove, what kind of uh, clinical problem we, uh, we want to solve, and how we would like to uh, uh, show and prove the technology that we will build would be um, safe and effective. And then we go through all those you know, well-defined development processes. And towards the end, um, let's say we created a technology, then we really heavily emphasize on transparent communications on what we have built that can include uh, regulatory agencies, also clinical and medical communities, and also you know patient advocacy groups anywhere outside yeah. of the company. I've heard for a long time there's a common pitfall, I think you touched on it earlier, of keeping the focus on patient centricity, but the common issue I hear about is this kind of notion of solutions looking for problems in the tech space. And I'm wondering what advice you have on how medical device companies, life science companies can keep their focus on real clinical need, like how important that is. And even though it it sounds really obvious, how it's often easier said than done. Absolutely. So I, as a technologist, (laughs) it's really easy for someone to fall into um, a, uh, an approach, quote unquote approach, of taking the technology first. So <laughs> if you hold, if you hold a hammer, it it, 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 it it's, it's quite difficult uh, for you to resist on uh, a, 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 a a tendency to you know hammer down all the things that might look like uh, <laughs> nails. <laughs> so so um, I think that that same kind of things happened in my. Um, in my in my career so far as well. So again, when we first started at Caption, uh, we were looking for many different um, problems. And uh, of course, one thing that comes quite easily for us uh, would be applying artificial intelligence on the, um, disease detection or um, some severity, um, you know, um, diagnosis. Um, um. Absolutely, that's that's a good that's a good ap- application of the AI. But uh, for our particular uh, domain, there was an even more um, profound problem, which was to fix the um, the um, the huge problem of image acquisition. Basically, the the beginning of all the pipeline, the clinical pipeline. So. The bottom line is that you got to talk to lots and lots of, you know, clinical experts, clinicians, or even some patients or okay. um, hospital admins. Um, you talk broadly to really figure out the thing that you want to solve actually matters to the, the clinical domain and clinical mm-hmm. professionals. So that's, I would say, the, the first approach, first one of the first um one of the first co- common pitfalls that I that I uh, that I found, and um, again, I I was I, I I fell into the same problem pitfall in my previous life. Um, another kind of common problem would be starting into development, jumping into the development without proper planning. So, medical device mm-hmm. creation, especially that involves artificial intelligence, is a long journey. It's a marathon. Um, at the end of the day, if you found out the thing that you created doesn't actually answer to the, the clinical community, all those you know, time and effort will be lost. <laughs> so you know, yes. it's really important for you to think through all the things um, during a uh, well thought out um, planning phase. Um, and during the and because of that, during the planning phase, you should really uh, try to create um, some initial prototype that can be used to get some uh, insights from medical professionals. 
that's you know, some of the uh, the key message um, that I can talk about the uh, the importance of the the um the um the having a good well thought out planning phase. Well, the medical professional angle is really interesting because it's really critical. First of all, that you win like the backing from payers, but also from FDA, but also you need to make sure that your target user is actually going to use the device and that it actually helps make their workflows a bit more efficient. And I've heard that can be a common stumbling block for some devices of that wins regulatory approval or it ticks boxes, but then people don't use it as much as the company had anticipated. And I'm curious what kind of feedback or advice you have on making sure that the end product does indeed like both enhance patient care, but also makes like the, the workflows a bit more efficient or streamlined, more accurate, et cetera, for the clinician who's involved as well. I don't think that there's any silver bullet. It's, it's really about, um, a have a really well thought out planning phase where you seek, uh, you, um, you really do create an initial prototype that can be presented to the medical professionals to get um, their sentiment and feedback. And B, even after that planning phase, even during the, the main R&D phase, um, you will get to learn something new, almost you know, constant, const constantly. Yeah. You need to plan, you need to modify, and you need to adjust uh, the plan um, according to all those inputs from the, the medical professionals. One thing that I would like to kind of emphasize is that medical professionals is one group of stakeholders. You also need to talk, you also need to bring in other stakeholders, such as um, regulatory people, uh, marketing people, sales, sales people, and also, you know, business people, all those kind of different, you know, stakeholders. So that when you create, um, a once you create a device, you would have, um, you so that you, when you create a device, the device you created would address not just the other uh, clinical problem, but also all those other considerations, including the, the business requirements. It takes a village. Yes. <laughs> I know it's a kind of um, obvious, but um, I have to admit that uh, at least I myself don't have any silver bullet. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's then maybe talk a little bit about the future. Uh -huh. So, okay, so looking forward, um, well, I mean, there's like so, I mean, there's a lot of different directions that I want to take this actually. So, let's maybe look forward into your specific division. Um, what do you anticipate some of the advances in AI technology, specifically through Medtronic, um, can help further gastrointestinal diagnostics and treatment? I mean, what do you see happening in the near future? In caveat to that, with I think we've seen this rapid adoption of artificial intelligence and the rapid growth of the technology. When I say near future, I mean that seemingly could be a month from now or five years from now. So I'll let you decide what you think uh, near future means. Uh, let me focus on the endoscopy unit um, because it's you know easier. I have a better visibility. At endoscopy unit, we already have uh, a. Uh, really powerful artificial intelligence powered um you know computer aided detection system called gi genius it's a uh, you know automated polyp detection system um i'm happy to talk about more details but basically we have a foundation technology um we have the tool we have the the research r d you know pipeline um you can imagine that we can take within in the near future we can take the same or similar technology and apply on other problems, other clinical um, products among within our endoscopy unit. Um, unfortunately, I cannot talk about too much specifics, but um, mm -hmm. you can see. <laughs> Sorry about that, but you can see the trend. You can uh, um, basically, you know, use the same or similar technology and apply to one of our other products within endoscopy unit. That can be something that would happen within, I don't know, near future. 
I was, well, I'm going to actually, maybe it's better to go back to GI Gen, a Genius Intelligent Endoscopy module. So can we actually talk about that a little bit more? And then maybe it would make more sense to uh, talk about what's next. Absolutely. So GI Genius Endoscopy module is a, um, it's a medical device that comes with, a, you know, really powerful hardware component, um, basically a workstation. And also AI system um, being employed and embedded in it. It basically, it seamlessly connects to colonoscopy system, existing colonoscopy system. The videos from existing colonoscopy system comes into the box and the video uh, enhanced by the AI system comes out from the box that gets cooked into the, uh, the, the, the viewing tower system. So basically what the system does is that you can think of that as a um, constantly working, uh, never tiring second pair of eyes that can give you a uh, good assistance during your colonoscopy procedure. It's a real time system. It looks at every single frame constant constantly and it finds, um, you know, a region within the input frame that is suspect of uh, polyps. So you can detect not just the, the obvious polyps, but you can also detect small and flat polyps that can easily go undetected, especially after the, the, at the end of the long day of uh, performing lots and lots of colonoscopy procedures. It um, demonstrated, the entire system demonstrated the increase of adenoma detection rate of up to about 14%. And Good. each, you know, 1% increase in adenoma detection rate is roughly uh, translated into a 3% decrease in uh, interval cancer uh, risk. So it, it matters a lot. Um, wow. You know, it decreases the cancer risk by providing assistance that, you know, mm -hmm. can seamlessly integrate it into the existing workflow of, um, you know, GI positions. I mean, just like from a high level, I'm curious, um, I think probably part of this predated your tenure at the company, but I'm curious about how the company worked with um, clinicians to kind of make sure that they were getting, um, making sure that the technology was indeed like helping tick those boxes that we talked about for like enhanced detection, decision support, training. It seems like all of those could lead to pretty substantial changes and in how a clinician would be trained, for instance, versus traditional. I'm not familiar with how endoscopists were trained before, but it seems like it could result in a pretty significant change there. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I can talk about is that um, the, the finding of a specific operating point. So let's say you have an AI system. If the AI system is hypersensitive, you know, putting a, a box, pretty much every single thing, every single frame that might resemble a, a poly, that can be really annoying. Um, theoretically, you could increase sensitivity or adenoma detection rate quite quite high, but um, you know, in reality, our human brain, our minds gets you know tired, and uh, we would eventually new, uh, snooze on all those you know false alarms. That's not that's not a good position to be in. Another uh, extreme um, end of the spectrum, opposite end of the spectrum, would be that you know. The system gives the uh, uh, the alerts in a very very selective way. Um, so whenever it provides a, a you know uh, a bounding box around the suspected polyp, um, almost all the time it gets correct, but um, at the same time uh, it misses a lot of actual true positives. So one thing that we spend a huge amount of effort and one thing that we wanted to make sure uh, was that the right balance between these two extremes so that um, once the system provides a, uh, a highlight of region of polyp there would be still high sensitivity but at the same time at a reasonable uh, false positive rate um, it was a long scientific process, but um, in short, what we did yeah. was that we um, involved lots and lots of different physicians, not from uh, 
single institutions, not from single country. We involved lots and lots of positions across different institutions across the world. So that's the power of, you know, Medtronic. Uh, we really have um, resources and we really have motivation, motivations for us to create a reliable and responsible AI technology that can be, you know, universally useful for the uh, lots and lots of different, you know, clinician um, profiles. So going back, we launched those kind of um, medical professional feedback sessions, and that definitely helped us to strike a, a good operating point. Well, as much as I want to continue having this beautiful conversation with you, we have to wrap it up. So I'm going to wrap it up with a 40,000 foot level question. Uh, so knowing what you know, based off of your experience, what developments or trends are you most excited about thinking about how artificial intelligence is being integrated in the life sciences? So what are you excited about what's coming up in general? Wow, that's a good question. And at the same time, that's a huge question. So <laughs> I don't have a glass ball, um, but uh, if I would venture to say, I think that uh, um, in the life science, especially within the, the domain of AI powered medical device section, I think that this is just, just a beginning. So what does that mean? So people are realizing that the AI technology can actually provide some real world value to the clinical pra uh, practices. So that's one thing. One other thing is that the tools the AI technologies, those are getting matured in a sense that uh, that can be used for engineering purposes um, in a reliable and a reproducible way. So that's the second thing. The third thing is that uh, now um, people are getting more, um, getting familiar and getting more traction into how to collaborate together. So for example, again, med, uh, medical device manufacturers, we start to know about um, building a responsible AI technologies for uh, healthcare. That's one thing. Another thing is that regulators are getting more and more um, comfortable at how to evaluate and regulate those kind of you know AI powered medical devices, and the third thing is that uh, medical professionals, physicians, are getting more familiar about uh, how to use and how to again evaluate medical device AI powered oh. medical devices by themselves, so that uh, they uh, they you know they can take active role of using the technology, which actually should be the way. Wow, well, Ha Hong, Chief. Artificial Intelligence Officer for Medtronic. Thank you for joining Brian and myself on AI Meets Life Sci. We so appreciate your time, your insights, and your enthusiasm for the future of AI in Life Sci. Thank you again so much. Thank you. My pleasure. And that's a wrap. Thank you again for joining us on our newly rebranded Device Talks AI. I was so excited to bring you this episode with Dr. Ha Hong of Medtronic, as well as our conversation with Joe Mish of SmartTrack. Once again, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your day to hear more about how artificial intelligence is being integrated into the medical device industry and how the largest OEMs are really embracing the new technology, as well as the stakeholders within the medical device industry finding ways to integrate artificial intelligence for better uh, workflow, productivity, and of course, patient outcomes. I'm Kayleen Brown. I'm the host of Device Talks AI and managing editor for Device Talks. And again, thank you very much for spending your time with us. Huge favor before I let you go, please subscribe to Device Talks on every major podcast platform, as well as on YouTube. It's Device Talks, one word. There you can find our podcast around artificial intelligence, around the industry itself, and a podcast that 
feature OEMs specifically, like Strucker Talks and Abbott Talks, for example. So please subscribe and get more MedTech conversations. I wanted to also say thank you again to SmartTrack, our supporter of this episode. If we didn't have your support, we wouldn't be able to continue this series. And thank you to Dr. Ha Hong for spending your time with us and sharing your insights into how Medtronic is integrating AI. Once again, I'm Kayleen Brown with Device Talks, and thank you for listening.